for joining us. Uh, we are going to be demoing Connect in a little bit here. Uh, my name is Shane Tacker. I'm the National Account Manager. I see some familiar faces on the line, so I don't think I need to go in too depth. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a Connect, uh, the fiber-based solution for OT networks, I think. Uh, is applicable for the majority of large-scale buildings. I know we have some customers here that are very familiar with the technology. Um, but if you have some questions, uh, feel free to type them in. We have some polls, too, going on. And uh, we'll begin the, uh, the webinar. So we are a company that has two product lines. Um, one is Optigo Connect, which we'll be talking about today, and the other is Visual Back. Visual Backnet is a diagnostic uh, uh, tool that runs over top of Wireshark for backnet traffic. Uh, and Optigo Connect is a fiber-based solution, uh, a backbone for smart buildings to connect all the building technologies, right? So we are out of Vancouver, Canada, uh, and we are a networking solution that's, that's targeting the building technologies, right? So this is everything that's bolted to the building, right? So everything that you see that uh, if you're in the office now, you'll see, uh, you'll see a security camera attached there. There's thermostats. Uh, what we focus on are those technologies, right? And why we do that is because we feel this industry is being ignored, right? Because if you look at the people that handle this type of technology on a day-to-day -day basis, right? There's, it's one of three people. And it's going to be a field technician, uh, it's going to be a facilities manager, and on occasion, it's going to have to be someone from high up on the integrator level, maybe the, the account manager or maybe even the in-house in IT person with, with an integrator, right? Uh, these people predominantly are experts in their own field, right? Um, security integrators are experts in cameras and access control. And HVAC or, or MSIs, which we'll talk a bit about later, uh, they're familiar with chillers, valves, uh, heaters, uh, actuators. They're very familiar with technology. And once upon a time, these integrators would go into a building and put in their own separate network, right? Uh, CCTV would have a coax network. Uh, HVAC would have their own twisted pair. But now that everything is using the internet to communicate, right, these type of people that were dealing with duct tape and screws are now forced into a realm, an industry, that they're not too familiar with and they're not comfortable with, right? So if we look at today's, today's IT closets and, and, and the networking you see inside of these smart buildings, right, you look at large conduits, hundreds of, 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 of copper, hundreds of pieces of fiber running through those conduits, uh, very intimidating for someone to put it in their own network, right? It's managed by the command line interface, right? So the CLI, the thing that, the green screen in the middle there that kind of looks like the matrix, right? Um, this is what is used to manage the system, right? And not everybody and the majority of people don't have a Cisco certification or they're not an engineer um, so they don't know how to run this, this type of behavior and, and to control and manage this network, right? So what ends up happening is the integrator then has to go through and, and ride on an IT, uh, on an IT network and deal with IT departments. And when they need to have something done, they have to go through them. Uh, and this creates conflict, right? So us at Optigo, we say, is there a way that we can take this massive closet and a massive amount of infrastructure in a smart building, and can we make it more efficient, right? Can we connect all the devices necessary using a fraction of infrastructure, right? And can we take this CLI, this command line interface um, with ones and zeros and commas and dashes, uh, and can we turn it into a easy to use management interface, right? It seems like every other technology graphical user interface, right? Except for this department, right? If I want to text someone, it's a very complicated technology when you get down to the zeros and ones. But what phone companies have done is they provided us 
a very easy to use GUI so we can do it with a click of a button, right? So why hasn't this industry adopted that, right? That's a question. So we'll start with our first poll here. Uh, I believe it's gonna pop up soon. Uh, it's gonna say just basically what realm are you in, right? Have you ever dealt with a separate network for your building technologies? Are you normally riding on, and this could uh, attain to sort of any realm if you're an end user, if you're an integrator, uh, have you run on a corporate network? Have you had a separate network, right? Do you pull your own fiber? Do you put it in your own network for your certain building technologies, right? So we'll give it some time. Feel free to uh, uh, to click what's that. You know, that's that's that's. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if anyone chooses that. Um, so yes, okay. So that, that's the answer we were all looking for. So the vast majority of everyone. Uh, chose yes and then this is good because this is where the industry is going right and if you've done that you know you've already seen the vision and you've already seen the wave what we call over here um, uh, of the future right and it's more and more prevalent that you're going to see this type of behavior have its own network right so the first thing we say um, when we want to deal with with having a, a very easy to use and secure network is we say to separate the networks, right? So if I were to pull, today I'm in, uh, it's Thursday in Vancouver, and, and I pull all the IP devices from this building and put it on the table, right? There's two very distinct domains, right? One is for the, uh, the users in this building, the IT devices, right? So I'm talking about my laptop that's connected, I got a phone right next to me, uh, there is uh, intercoms here, uh, printer just down the hall. These types of technologies are, are insured, are made to ensure the success of the people in this building, right? It's very user-centric, right? And because the users come in and out of the buildings, it deviates so much, right? So today's Thursday, there's probably a thousand computers attached to or, or connected to this network, right? On Saturday, when no one's in here, or even at seven o'clock for that matter, when no one's in here, there might be 50, right? So because of this very sporadic and dynamic traffic pattern, right, it makes sense for a trained group of experts to manage and monitor this type of behavior because they have to constantly look to see if there's going to be any threats there because you know it, it's it's hard to it's very easy to point out someone in a line of people that's standing still right but if you have to point them out and they're constantly moving this becomes much harder right so if we look at the other group of devices that are that are attached to this network much different story right so this is focusing on the building technologies right uh, focusing on the machine-to-machine -machine communication, right? So this is very predictable and it's very static, right? So today there is, let's say, a thousand devices connected to this building in Vancouver. Uh, on Saturday when no one's in there, there's going to be a thousand devices connected, right? No one's going to come in and add a security camera without the integrator or the end user knowing, right? Or at least hopefully not, right? So does it make sense to have this type of behavior have to go through the IT network and to have to go through the IT department, right? If it's very easy to manage and it has a much different behavior and even protocol for that much, for, for that matter, right? When we talk about things like BACnet, right? Much different behavior. These two separations seem to have some sort of discourse and there's, uh, uh, we believe, that there needs to be a separate network for both of these realms, right? So the first, uh, the, the second thing we do is we do not duplicate an IT network for the OT because that's gonna cost far too much money, right? We're not gonna take these large uh, Cisco and HP switches that are amazing switches geared for IT and plop them over to the OT, right? Just because they pass traffic, right? So what we've done is we take network switches and splitters that are specifically tailored for this industry, right? So you're not paying uh, for a switch that you're using only 5% of the functionality, right? So real quick, the green guy there is our head end, okay? So that is what starts all the networks. 
And then the blue guys, so you see a 16 port there, you have a 24 port down here, those are edge switches. So that's what's connecting uh, into these uh, devices via RJ45, right? Uh, what makes this different though is, are these splitters here. So these are called passive splitters, okay? So on the top there, there's one coming in, two coming out, and on the left there, there's one coming in and eight coming out. So just for reference, the one to eight is about the size of your iPhone, right? And the one to two is about the size of your index finger, right? Very small, very flexible, right? So what that looks like is we're able to split the communication and split the, uh, uh, the network communication and the actual light, right? So in the middle there, it's a one to two splitter. And inside those splitters is just glass and mirrors and plastic, hence the word passive splitter, completely passive. No, no climate control, no power, no nothing, right? So we have a one to two coming into a one to three. So four switches are being back called onto a single strand of fiber, right? So this technology is called passive optical networking, right? So it was developed originally by Verizon Fios for fiber to the home, right? They said, is there a way that we can make a more efficient run to get fiber to each person's home, right? So in, OL, in PON terms, there's an OLT, it's a head end, and an ONU, which is an edge switch. We call them head ends and edge switches because that's all they do, right? So they came up with a way to split this fiber passively, right? So that way, you can run a single strand down a street and you can split it to wherever it needs, right? So this was originally the design, right? So if you were to picture a street in Japan, right, and you have 10 streets on the house, rather than running a strand of fiber to each house and back to Verizon headquarters, right, they just ran a single strand down the street, then they split it one to two times for each house. Now if you take that and you were to flip it right side up, you have a high rise, right? So it's the exact same technology, but it's in the proper form factor and price point for this industry. The only difference between us and Verizon or AT&T or I see some Canadians here, TELUS Optic TV uses the same technology. The only difference is their core switch is, a, is probably the size of a fridge uh, and it costs a million dollars, whereas we have actual tailored switches for this application, right? So the key thing here, this is, this is what a passive daisy chain looks like, right? So like I was saying before on the left there, if you could picture running a strand from each house back to Verizon headquarters, that would have been far too expensive, right? So instead, they ran a single strand down, split light off wherever they needed it to be, and they got it was the most efficient way to pass fiber. Now the entire world is adopting it for large uh, multi-city projects for Wi-Fi, uh, and, and connecting uh, city to city. But we are taking this to the smart building, okay? So here's the, here's the passive splitters. These are the special sauce. Um, they use single mode fiber, so extremely good bend radius. This is a telco grade uh, communication level that is simplified by us and made specifically for uh, this application, right? So all it really is is a water strainer, right? So you have one strand coming in for this example. You have one strand coming in. All it's doing is splitting that light eight times passively, and then it's going to, uh, to, to eight outputs, right? And because of this, you're able to make a very flexible uh, uh, topology with your fiber. So there's no fiber being wasted, right? If I need three strands on the fourth floor, one to three split it, right? And it can, keeps going through. If I need two on the second floor, you can do one to two, right? extremely flexible and most efficient way. So with this flexibility, I'll dive into the topologies here, right? And we can do very, uh, you can mix and match these, but these are the main ones we see, right? So the first is a points and multipoint. So this is also called a tree topology, because if you could picture it, uh, if you break it off one to eight times and you continue breaking off, it's gonna look like a tree, right? Just branching out. So this is good for a low rise, right? For this example, we did it uh, a condo in Denver. There was eight buildings, okay? It was all, all, all two-story buildings, I think. Uh, 
And so we split the fiber eight times. And then once we got into the buildings, we split it again, right? So this kind of topology is amazing for a shopping center, uh, campus, uh, multifamily, uh, anything that's a very low rise, right? It needs to get uh, fiber to many different locations, right? Next is the daisy chain. So we already kind of went over this. This was this is what the technology was built for, right? This daisy chain is is where it all started, right? So the key thing here is there's one to two splitters, um, but most importantly, it's called a passive daisy chain, right? So it's passively splitting the light. So if this second switch were to fail, right, it would continue through because this right here is a completely passive component, right? So per, on average, we can get around 24 nodes on a single strand of fiber. So you have a 20 story high rise, no problem. We get it done with a single strand, right? Uh, and it's not an active, that's where I was going with that. It's not an active daisy chain, right? An active daisy chain is using copper and power to, uh, to, to, use, to use a daisy chain to get more nodes on, right? But if one goes out, they all go out. It's like your Christmas tree lights. Uh, timing is pretty good for that analogy, too. Uh, so a huge flaw in PON, or passive optical networking, was that there was a single point of failure, right? So if we go back here, yes, it's passive, and if the second switch fails, it will continue through. However, if this S2 goes out, uh, you're, you're kind of hooped, right? So we address that, and it, we do it at a, an amazing cost, okay? So normally, to make this guy redundant, to make this network on the left there redundant, you have to duplicate the network, right? So you're adding a core switch, and then you're running two strands to each switch and adding and doubling your SFPs, right? You're essentially completely duplicating the network minus the switches, right? For us, all you're doing is adding a switch, right, uh, which is at a very good price point, and then you're adding a, a different splitter. So rather than over here where it's a 1 to 8, right, to make that redundant, you're now just going to put a 2 to 8 splitter there, and then the rest stays the same, right? So we have one S2 lighting up the network, okay? The bottom S2 is in protect mode, and it's constantly looking to see if the fiber goes dark, right? If the active were to fail, the bottom would take over in around 15 seconds, okay? So this is head-end redundancy, right? And this is big for critical facilities like financial, hospitality, uh, medicinal marijuana facilities, right? Anything that's critical facilities. So... Next is a daisy chain form of redundancy, right? We take the daisy chain and we ring it around, right? So this is good for high rises, perimeter fencing. Um, the active lights up the fiber. If that were to fail, the bottom would take over, right? If there is a cut or a break in the ring through the conduit and takes up the fiber, they'll both light it up, okay? So this is called our healing ring. So this is fiber head end, and then you could also put a redundant power supply on some of our switches. We call it triple threat. Right? And then, of course, you can mix and match. So you can do a, a point to multi-point and then daisy chain. Uh, the key here is we can get the splitters and topology to match the exact building architecture, right? This is the most efficient way of laying it. So there's the topologies. Uh, hopefully, you get a good... Uh, a knowledge of how this saves you money, right? Less infrastructure, less fiber, smaller conduits, less labor, quicker commissioning. On average, Optigo will save you roughly 50% total cost of ownership, right? The, hot, the bigger the application, the more you save. We can get into the 80s to even sometimes even close to 90, which is, which is possible with our topology, right? So we use single mode fiber, right? We will be having a copper solution for this uh, at the end of March, okay? But there's always some confusion when it comes to fiber, right? So we use single mode fiber. We do not operate with multi-mode fiber and it'll become very, it'll become evident uh, uh, after this slide. Um, single mode fiber, you know, it's the fiber of the future. This is what telco, this is what the, the telcos use, what the ISPs use. If you ever want to go from city to city, it's all single mode, right? The, the predicted uh, uh, 
bandwidth limitation is is insane, right? It's 50 terahertz, right? It can reach city to city. Amazing bend radius. You can you can bend it right around a quarter, um, uh, and there's no interference, right? And then the normal normal uh, attributes to fiber two, no no interference when when it, with uh, uh, electric fields, longer bandwidth, things like that. So we kind of went over that. I won't stress about this, but this is why we use single mode fiber. Okay, and this is why it was developed. So multi mode fiber is essentially saying that there is multiple paths for the light to take, right? And because of this, it's a thicker strand, so it can't go as far as a thinner strand, right? I like to think of it as a ping pong ball, right? So with multi-mode, I want you to picture having a very large tube and throwing that ping pong ball down that tube, right? It's gonna bounce uh, a lot, and when it turns a corner, it's going to bounce even more and slow down, right? Because that that strand is too thick. Now, a single mode, single mode is nine micron, so it's exactly the size uh, that allows the light to push through, right? It's just a tiny bit bigger. So now, when that fiber turns and you bend it, it actually guides and bends the light with it. So there's no there's no loss at all. So now, I'll picture that large tube that's just uh, a centimeter larger than a ping pong ball, right? And you throw it down there. If it were to turn a corner, the ping pong ball would simply just go, go with it, right? It wouldn't bounce a lot like multi-mode fiber, right? So this is why the technology was built on single mode. It was because of the, uh, to get fiber to the home and the distances, right? With multi-mode, there's too, there's too many deviations and too many traffic patterns that the light has to go through, right? So we are based on single mode fiber. So last but not least, I think I got five minutes here. I'll jump to the management, right? So we have three tiers of management. Unmanaged switches, fantastic for commissioning. Uh, they plug and play. Everything passes traffic, but it's a nightmare for security, right? Ports are opened, and when uh, you go to commission or troubleshoot or something goes wrong and there's more than 10 switches, have fun finding that. Next is individual management. So this is what you see on Cisco, HP, Netgear, all these managed switches. They're saying each switch individually is managed, right? So if you have a building with 10 switches, you have a spreadsheet with 10 IP addresses, 10 passwords, uh, and you have to log into each one of those, uh, hire someone that's Cisco certified, uh, configure VLAN, shut down port, all the fun stuff. Uh, great for security, nightmare for scalability, and a nightmare for cost, right? What we offer is unified management or centralized management. Can you see my screen now? So it's hosted on the head end. It's a single IP address, a single password. You log in and you get a graphical user interface, right? Something that uses the mouse rather than the keyboard, right? Everyone can use it. It's very Gmail-esque and uh, very intuitive. So I won't run through the entire, uh, every button in here, but I'll highlight a couple, right? So first one is bandwidth. Okay, so a real-time monitor, monitoring tool uh, to see how much bandwidth I have available in the network, right? Uh, it's acting a little slow right now, but you can see upstream and downstream. This will be, there we go. There's nothing much connected to our unit, so not much bandwidth is, is, is being used, right? But this will adjust real-time when you add something. Next is the edge switches. So the edge switches switches are completely plug and play, right? So you pop in, you plug in an Optigo 24 port. It automat it, this the one view will automatically discover it. It'll say this is my MAC address. I'm a 24 port, and here is how much PoE I'm drawing, right? So each switch will come with a PoE budget, and then it'll break it down by port how much PoE I'm drawing, right? So this is important because normally with PoE and bandwidth for that matter, it's all trial and error, right? I plug something in, it doesn't work, okay, something must be wrong. Here, it gives you good insight that anyone can read and access to into what's going on in your network, right? Next is the ports page. The ports page is most popular. So it's a port by port management, okay? So here, I can see any port I want. I can change the VLAN. If I want to change a VLAN, backspace two, done. It's on VLAN two, right? If I want to trunk multiple ones, okay, and go from here and just set it to trunk, and from there I can just have multiple VLANs, right? 
Uh, I can view all active ports. I can view all troubled ports. Clear filter. Very easy to use. And this is what I was talking about when I say very Gmail-esque. Right? So I can dive into each port as well. Right? I can see what's connected, what MAC address is there, how much power it's drawing, the, the actual bandwidth, what it's doing to you, if it's doing unicast, broadcast, and whatnot. But most importantly, when we get into PoE, stuff like cameras and uh, PoE access control is a big one, and lighting for that matter. I can reset the PoE from the GUI, right? Rather than going in there and physically unplugging it, plugging it back in, I can just do all this from, the, from one view, right? And that's extremely powerful. Rather than sending someone there um, for, what, 50 bucks an hour to go do a simple thing, access it remotely through VPN, done, reset the camera. The last thing I'll mention is port security. And this is, unfortunately, in today's world, this is very, this is very important, right? So out of the box, Opti goes completely plug and play, as I said, right? Um, it's great for commissioning, but I'm sure a lot of you on the line were kind of raising an eyebrow because that is not good for having a secure network, right? So after Opti goes commissioned and the devices are plugged in, and it's time to sign off and, and have a turnover, right? You can secure active and secure inactive ports. And you click our one click secure button. So what our head end is doing is going through each switch in the network. And on each switch, it's going through each port. Now, if there's nothing connected to the port, it simply shuts it down, right? If there is a device connected to the port, it will lock itself to the MAC address of that device, right? So now when someone comes and unplugs a camera, and plugs in a laptop, it will not pass traffic, right? So we see this in specifications all the time. It's called port security, right? So we do it in a single button, and because it's a single button, it's more likely to be used, right? If you have a technician going there to add a camera, you can simply just open up the port and save, right? Or I can go there and unlock the entire system. If he's gonna be there a while, he does his commissioning. Once he's finished, lock it back up, you're good to go. Right, so that's one view in a nutshell. Um, very uh, underlying issue there is we're making it easy for the people that deal with this type of technology. Right, the IT department and IT experts predominantly don't deal with this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, they deal with it, but the people dealing with the day-to-day -day basis are either the technicians or the facilities managers, plain and simple. Right. So, thank you for for sitting through that. Uh, key takeaways here are a it's going to it's going to save you at least 50% uh, on your next deployment right and b it's going to be used and maintained for someone that requires less money less experience and uh, and is already in your organization right so anything that involves uh, long reach anything that involves uh, i would say more than four switches uh, we, that is sort of our wheelhouse. That's our threshold, right? Uh, we're all around the world right now. We have uh, integrators and distribution uh, in, East, in Europe, Australia, uh, North America. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in now. Uh, I can answer them. Uh, if not, uh, I will follow up with each of you uh, via email. Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you for your time. This will be recorded. I will send this out as well, and then uh, we will take it from there. So have a great holidays. Thanks for spending 30 minutes with us uh, in Vancouver today, and uh, have a Merry Christmas. Bye.